Clint Eastwood and John Wayne are two icons of conservative Hollywood masculinity, but despite their similarities both on and off screen, the two never worked together. Why? Here's the truth of John Wayne and Clint Eastwood's relationship. By the time Clint Eastwood came onto the scene with the TV series Rawhide in 1959, John Wayne was at the height of his legendary career. While Eastwood was sharpening his acting chops as Rowdy Yates for the next eight years, Wayne was churning out one classic after another, including The Alamo and The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. Then in 1964, while Eastwood was on a break from Rawhide, he was offered a starring role in a western with an up-and-coming Italian director in Spain. It was a fistful of dollars, and it wasn't easy thanks to the language barrier. As Eastwood recalled on Inside the Actor's Studio, Sergio Leone didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Italian, so... <laughs> I was kind of on my own. It was the first Western of its kind. The dialogue was thin, the main character had no name, and he lacked the usual charm required from the protagonist. It was a box office hit, and not just in Italy. So two sequels immediately followed, including the instant classic The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which redefined the Western genre. Despite its success, though, Wayne was evidently uninterested in working with Leone, at least judging by the tortured development of the film Rooster Cogburn. The Wayne considered a number of directors before settling for the inexperienced Stuart Miller, who Wayne reportedly didn't even like. It doesn't seem as though Leone was ever considered. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood didn't meet in person until 1976, when Eastwood visited the set of Wayne's film The Shootist. Ron Howard, a co-star in the film, said that when Wayne heard Eastwood was coming to visit, he inquired about the man's politics. By the 70s, Wayne was increasingly isolated in Hollywood as a firm conservative, especially after a 1971 Playboy interview where he advocated for a form of white supremacy, saying it was needed, quote, until the blacks are educated to a point of responsibility. Still, Wayne said in an interview that he had always considered himself a liberal of sorts, even if nobody else did. He insisted that he didn't vote on party lines, but rather for the individual. Eastwood also shared this sentiment, at least from a 2020 interview with the Wall Street Journal, in which he spoke about being a libertarian as, quote, somebody who has respect for other people's ideas and is willing to learn constantly. John Wayne was originally offered the lead part in Dirty Harry and later regretted turning it down, according to John Wayne, The Life and Legend. Interestingly, Eastwood revealed on Inside the Actor Studio that he had heard Paul Newman had also been offered the part, but wasn't interested due to some of its political undertones. So Eastwood, being the next runner-up, was cast as Inspector Harry Callahan in 1971, and the film went on to be a wildly successful franchise. While the critics tore it apart for its excessive violence and glorification of a bad cop, it raked in $22 million at the box office, spawning several sequels. Of course, in hindsight, there are several reasons why Eastwood was probably the better fit than Wayne. Wayne was opposed to excessive violence in films and protested against depictions of cops bending or breaking the law. Eastwood, on the other hand, had a history of playing anti-heroes, and it didn't hurt that he also did most of his own stunts, while Wayne's health was declining. Still, Wayne said in his biography, I made a mistake with that one. Wayne didn't just meet Eastwood on the set of The Shootist in 1976. He also had to deal with Eastwood's outsized Hollywood reputation. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, the Duke was not impressed with much of Don Siegel's direction on The Shootist, and the two frequently argued. In fact, their feuding started even before the film began, with Siegel telling a reporter for the Carson City newspaper, Wayne is supposed to eat directors for breakfast, but if he tries to eat me, he'll get indigestion. Siegel also had to shoot a handful of scenes around Wayne while he was recovering from a bronchial infection. When Wayne returned, most of what the director did while he was gone was okay, except for a scene where Wayne's stunt double shot a man in the back as he attempted to run out of the saloon. Wayne was livid. According to his co-star Hugh O'Brien, Wayne said, Wait a minute, I've never shot anybody in the back and I'm not going to start now. According to Eastwood, he later heard that Siegel later tried to have Wayne ambush another villain and Wayne again refused to shoot him in the back. Siegel said, quote, Clint Eastwood would have shot him in the back, to which Wayne replied, I don't care what that kid would have done, I don't shoot him in the back. Clint Eastwood's characters undeniably shook up the format of American westerns. The straightforward good guy and bad guy dynamic became more ambiguous and therefore far more interesting. Eastwood's protagonists often fueled the plot with vengeance like in the outlaw Josie Wales. While John Wayne's were justly upheld by honorable ethics like in El Dorado, Eastwood's characters also seemed to directly reflect the new approaches to morality in cinema in the 1970s. Wayne's ideals were cultivated 30 years prior and his convictions oftentimes appeared black and white in a full-color world. In Wayne's damaging Playboy interview, he talked about the dwindling state of democracy due to Americans' growing disrespect for authority, mentioning the Black Panther's treatment towards police and the Vietnam War protests. He was also candid about his thoughts toward pictures that veered off course from traditional Western frameworks like High Noon. In the film, a retired marshal has to face an outlaw gang alone after the townsfolk refuse to help him. 
In the end, the character prevails but throws his badge in the dust before hopping in a carriage to leave town with his new wife. Wayne told the interviewer, It's the most un-American thing I've ever seen in my whole life. In fact, Wayne disliked it so much that he later made the film Rio Bravo as a direct response. But for Eastwood, moral dilemmas and ambiguous endings like the ones pioneered in High Noon were far more interesting, a thinking that led him to make unusual and offbeat westerns like High Plains Drifter and Pale Rider. John Wayne preferred working with the best in the business since he seemed to consider himself as such. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, he felt that directors needed to be as well-rounded and well-experienced in their careers as he was. For example, he loudly detested Stuart Miller, who directed him and Katherine Hepburn in Rooster Cogburn, saying on Phil Donahue, quote, he was a poor director. He then added, I kind of knew around the business. And, <laughs> oh, how old and there's some question about, you know, his capabilities. This was also the case for actors, and he gave his True Grit co-star Kim Darby no slack for what he thought was a lackluster performance in the 21-year-old's first major role, despite that Wayne finally won an Oscar for the film. So what does this have to do with Clint Eastwood? Well, Eastwood began directing in 1971. His first film was Play Misty For Me, which wasn't a western. In 1973, though, Eastwood tried his hand at directing a western. The result was High Plains Drifter, which many consider to be a classic. Wayne, however, didn't, and his strong feelings about Eastwood's sophomore effort would go a long way towards defining their relationship. In 1973, following High Plains Drifter, Eastwood was sent a script for a new project called The Hostels. According to John Wayne, The Life and Legend, when the script for The Hostels came to Clint Eastwood's production company Mount Paso, Eastwood sent it over to John Wayne to see if he'd want to co-star in the film with him. The story, which Eastwood admitted needed some work, was about a younger guy who won half of a ranch that was owned by an older guy. The two unsurprisingly don't get along at first, but in the end have to work together to fight off a band of hostiles that come to take over the property. The Duke politely declined the offer and sent the script back. After Eastwood sent the script to Wayne a second time, though, Wayne let Eastwood have it. Rather than respond directly to the offer to appear in the hostels, Wayne instead wrote Eastwood an angry letter where he expressed anger towards Eastwood for what Wayne perceived as un-American ideals and High Plains Drifter. Wayne specifically griped that the townspeople did not, quote, accurately represent the spirit of the pioneers who had made America great. Eastwood didn't bother to write back. He told film critic Kenneth Turin, I realized that there's two different generations and he wouldn't understand what I was doing. High Plains Drifter was meant to be a fable. It wasn't meant to show the hours of pioneering drudgery. It wasn't supposed to be anything about settling the West. Still, that didn't keep Eastwood from sending Wayne a third version of the script for the hostels. Wayne was given the third draft by his son while they were out sailing, as his son thought Wayne should reconsider. Instead, Wayne said, this piece of shit again, and threw it in the ocean. According to a Wayne biography, Duke, a love story, he told a colleague, this kind of stuff is all they know how to write these days. Someone like me and Eastwood ride into town, know everything, act the big guys, and everyone else is a bunch of idiots. Eastwood never went on to make the hostels. Wayne and Eastwood also had something else in common. They both held director John Ford in very high regard. John Wayne had incredible loyalty to Ford, who taught Wayne everything he knew, from his famous walk to the charming intonation in which all of Wayne's characters spoke. Wayne even called him coach. However, Ford put a lot of pressure on Wayne, no matter the circumstances whether it was humiliating him on set or berating him for not enlisting during World War II. But despite the tensions that ebbed and flowed between the two icons, Wayne was always loyal to Ford and openly referred to Ford's advice often when he was on other sets, from how to sequence a shot to the rhythm of delivering emotion in a scene. Eastwood was also inspired by Ford throughout his own career. During an event at the Directors Guild of America, Eastwood said that Ford's influence on directors, quote, is like osmosis, and that he watched Ford's films like Stagecoach in the theater as a kid. But for Eastwood, Ford's equations for Westerns were simply jumping off points rather than rules to abide by, as he enjoyed the depth required to cultivate heroes that weren't necessarily straightforward in their intentions or approachability. When John Wayne had his one-sided exchange with Clint Eastwood over High Plains Drifter, it was the early 1970s, when Eastwood's career was on the upswing while Wayne's was on the down. Wayne had started to take roles he wasn't really interested in, such as the title character in McHugh, for the sake of working. On top of that, Wayne's health was declining quickly. He had recovered from lung cancer after a major surgery in 1964, but then started developing heart problems. On top of that, doctors found he had stomach cancer in 1975, right before filming The Shootist. Meanwhile, Eastwood had started his own production company, Mount Paso, in 1967. In 1971, Eastwood received a Golden Globe for world film favorites. At the start of the decade, Wayne was still on top of the world, while Eastwood was just hitting it big. By the end, in June 1979, Eastwood's film Escape from Alcatraz cemented him as one of the biggest stars in the world, just two weeks after Wayne passed away from cancer. Sadly, we'll never know what might have happened if the two icons had found the common ground to work together. Check out one of our newest videos right here!
Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.